This is Salma Schimmel for the Group Room at the ESMO 2012 Congress happening now in Vienna. And we're joined now by Dr. Jim Cleary, who is on the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin Carbone Cancer Center. Hello, Dr. Cleary. Hello. It seems like there's a diverse kind of a, a, a bias and a stigma. It, you have social attitudes, you have physician attitudes, and you have patient attitudes, mm -hmm. and sometimes they overlap, but also there are really profound differences for each one of these subgroups that influence um, not only access, but how a whole country begins to view uh, drugs, the opioids. So we use a WHO model to represent this, and it's a, it's a simple triangle. And on one side you have drug availability, on the bottom you have uh, laws and policies, and on this side you have education. And it's not just education of clinicians, it's education of the public, it's education of um, patients. We know from research done at the University of Wisconsin, Professor Sandy Ward in the School of Nursing, patients don't want to mention the fact that they're in pain because it's taking away from their critical doctor's time. But over and over again, studies have shown the impact of poorly treated pain on a patient's quality of life, even their ability to get chemotherapy and other th treatments. There's also, unfortunately, patients that in this way become their own worst enemy, fearful that if they acknowledge their pain, it means that the cancer is winning, mm -hmm. fearful that they will lose control and not be able to be fully active in, in their lives. One of the things that we try to do in the whole palliative care agenda is to break down these stigmatizing uh, thoughts, comments, and really make this an open um, discussion with family and others. Yes, it's all right to take opioids. The likelihood of addiction if you don't have a previous problem with medications is very small. And I've used the term addiction here. Increasingly, we're using the term dependency syndrome as the new language for addiction. But it is a constant fear, the fear of addiction. The fear that if, in fact, I'm on um, morphine, the end must be near. Isn't morphine a drug reserved only for people who are dying? And if I take morphine, then I must be dying. The reality is we start many people on morphine, we successfully um, reduce the size of their cancer and we reduce the amount of pain and we can actually get people off morphine. There are other people though who continue on morphine, continue to function very well, going to work and functioning in their lives, um, maintaining a very good quality of life. The delivery systems, you've got oral compounds, you've got injectables, you've got a transdermal patch. Do we have ideas of which may be considered the more desirable or best way to deliver pain control? The WHO, the World Health Organization, has promoted the oral use of uh, medicines. And if we start considering and balancing the cost of these medicines and availability, oral morphine really is the cheapest and the best way of delivering these. There are newer, newer guidelines, including guidelines from the European Association of Palliative Care, saying that there may be other methods, including the transdermal patch, but these tend to be very expensive, and they're not a medication that would be first-line therapy for most of us in the United States, nor should they, in my view, actually be first-line therapies in low and middle income countries that are struggling even to get morphine in there and one of the reasons is because of the cost. Morphine can be delivered very, very cheaply. Are there real strong efforts to maybe modify physician education on the medical school level? Because you've got young medical students, maybe they've never even encountered a family member yet who's died and their grandparents are still living. You've got to get these young adults comfortable which is sort of not part of the norm with the concept of death. Palliative care is now actually being included in curriculum increasingly. One of the challenges we face is that while we can teach courses on this, the, the students go out into the wards where they're actually dealing, the wards and clinics where they're dealing with older doctors who have not been trained. So this has to be a simultaneous we a process. We have to teach the old dogs new tricks in order for them to actually be teaching the new dogs as well. Medical students particularly model their behaviour on what they see. 
So if we have a surgeon who doesn't go into a room and have these discussions, that's the challenge. So particularly palliative care physicians have to increasingly model this, be available and demonstrate that this is not a bad part of medicine. And the feedback we can get from students is that this is one of the most rewarding experiences that they have. What role do you think patient advocates can play right now? So many great organizations across uh, the world in supporting the efforts of palliative care specialists. What do you need from the advocate community? The advocate community needs to speak up on this issue. And again, many people are putting the priority on, I need this drug, I need that drug, and the chemotherapy drugs. Yes, we do need radiotherapy, but for a penny a day medicine, morphine in a country, these advocates need to be up and speaking about this. Um, the challenge that we face is that in actual fact, there are stigma, we have the laws. Yes. Um, if I look back though at the birthing movement, it was the advocates, it was women who said, we need to change the way children are delivered in Western countries. Um, I think we need that same um, movement from patients saying my mother needs pain relief, my father needs pain relief, I need pain relief. And that is one of the critical things that it's, if I were in this situation with advanced cancer, I would want pain relief. I thank you, Dr. Jim Cleary, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin Carbone Cancer Center, Director of Pain and Policy Studies Group, a WHO collaborating center for pain policy and palliative care, and former president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Thank you. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.